Good afternoon to everybody. We are starting our webinar. My name is Andrius Kubilius. I am a member of the European Parliament and also chairing this uh, forum of the Friends of European Russia. And uh, as uh, usually, we have interesting uh, discussions, interesting webinars. And this time, uh, we have a privilege uh, uh, to we have a presentation of a recent very important paper, which was produced by Fyodor Krashenikov and Vladimir Milov, and which has a uh, very uh, interesting title, The Normal Russia of the Future. Yes, we can. I said to Fyodor and Vladimir, it reminds me Obama. Uh, <laughs> no, yes, we can, uh, but uh, uh, I think that uh, it's good to borrow some good uh, statements, especially when we are talking about uh, Russia and the future of, the, of Russian democracy, because not everybody believes in possibility of Russian democracy. I'm always, I need to confess that in, in European Parliament, uh, uh, I feel myself uh, and, and, and uh, colleagues, uh, which, you know, all of us, we believe in Russian democracy, but we are in in quite a minority. So still we need to increase our church. And, and that is where always we're asking uh, our friends from Russian opposition and, and civil society uh, to give arguments, to give us arguments why all of us, we need to uh, believe in the in, in possibility of Russian democracy and what is needed to be done, how to come back to uh, uh, democratic uh, development of uh, Russia. That is what we are discussing in, in our different forums, what we discussed uh, in, uh, in uh, Brussels Dialogue, and we continue in the steering uh, committee of Brussels Dialogue to discuss all, all the challenges and issues and perspectives of Russia uh, becoming uh, a democratic, normal country. Uh, that is what we uh, are uh, looking for EU strategy how to help Russian uh, transformation to such a country. And that is what we are writing in our second report in the European Parliament, which will, I hope, will be uh, will be voted in uh, perhaps next next January. So that is uh, quite quite uh, mm, uh, clear what we you know. Uh, what is what is the debate about? Uh, and again and again, I can praise uh, uh, those from uh, Russian opposition, from Russian civil society, who are presenting such um, uh, very important papers to us, which is very, very interesting to read, uh, very interesting to discuss. And now we have a privilege, uh, really, to discuss uh, this paper of Fyodor Krashenikov and Vladimir Milov in a really very good uh, company of uh, political uh, analysts, political scientists. And that's what uh, makes always our, our discussions very, uh, of a very great value. As always, uh, first of all, uh, I will ask uh, maybe Vladimir to start, Jan Fyodor. Uh, and you know, you as uh, speakers of today, you will have a round of 10 minutes each. Then we shall switch to comments, uh, where we have distinguished uh, four speakers. Each of them will have around seven minutes. I will uh, present them when, when the time uh, for the, uh, the speaking time will come. And as always, from the very beginning, uh, I would uh, urge everybody who wants to participate in the discussion to write your questions into the chat and uh, I hope that we shall have enough of time to uh, to to answer to discuss those questions also so now I'm turning to Vladimir Milov one of uh, the writers one of the authors of this brilliant paper Vladimir Milov whom we know very well and who is really quite often on our webinars uh, uh, is vice president for international advocacy, Free Russia Foundation. And of course, you know, I will not remind all his previous positions in, in reformist governments and so on and so on. Uh, and Vladimir, tell us uh, 
uh, very simply. What does it mean, normal Russia of the future? Uh, thank uh, you very much. First, uh, thank you, Andres, for hosting this. And uh, we do need to have these kind of discussions uh, today. Uh, difficult as it may seem, we, we know in which situation we're all finding ourselves with Putin's brutal and provoked aggression against Ukraine. But I think we need to look forward and um, really understand that building this kind of normal Russia, which peacefully coexists with its neighbors, which is not authoritarian, which is democratic, that is the only guarantee of uh, moving forward without wars, uh, without uh, conflict and security threats uh, and so on, because uh, authoritarian Russia will need uh, you know, to project its imperial ambitions uh, to sustain itself in power, so it will always come back striking again. Uh, we actually have been uh, saying for many years with Boris Nemtsov, with Alexei Navalny, with many of our friends that Putin's repression and lawless behavior will not just stop at home. He will be exporting it further, projecting his authoritarian power onto neighboring states and threatening the world order. So this is like more or less an existential discussion to us. Uh, we clearly understand that there will be no normalcy and no security in Europe and broadly in the world if Russia does not become democratic, free and uh, peaceful. So uh, you asked the question, what is normal Russia? Normal Russia is a country where people's rights, citizens' rights are respected and put above everything else. A normal Russia is a country which decides its domestic and foreign policy not because something clicked in the head of a crazy dictator, but because there's a, a free popular will uh, and, and so on. Uh, normal Russia is a country where rules are respected, laws are respected, and this includes first and foremost international rule-based rule order and uh, international law as it was adopted in Russia's first constitution, democratic constitution of 1993, international law and international commitments stand above national legislation. And uh, when Russia was relatively free, this was uh, respected. So uh, we needed uh, to bring down sort of a, a blueprint of a vision of how to move forward with um, uh, trying to build a normal democratic uh, Russia of the future, because uh, obviously these discussions intensified in the light of Putin's aggression against Ukraine. There, there is a very strong camp which is saying right now that uh, democratic Russia, peaceful Russia will never be possible. We actually tried to summarize uh, some arguments and ideas on how to show and prove that, yes, there is a way forward in this regard. And uh, I think the point number one is that uh, this should not be taken as a light exercise. Like we are the rosy dreamers who put these ideas on paper and then they will automatically be implemented in real life. It is definitely very complicated. Uh, obviously there is a strong negative legacy of this archaic uh, traditionalist imperialist uh, worldview uh, that is incorporated in various incarnations of the Russian state across uh, decades and centuries. Yes, Russian population does not have um, a significant experience of democratic governance, which also contributed to the failure of the, the democratic experiment of the 1990s. There is obviously a, a, a very serious set of consequences of uh, Putin's aggression. Russia's isolation, uh, the cult of brutality and, and blatant force, uh, cult of lawlessness that has emerged uh, in Russia in the recent couple of years, that is a very difficult legacy. Uh, it is, it's not going to be easy to overcome it. However, what we try to illustrate uh, in this paper with Fyodor is that it is still possible to do so for several reasons. Uh, reason number one, I think the major ally here is the Russian population, which uh, historically, and this is also proven by lots of uh, the current data, was uh, always significantly supportive of a uh, democratic system of governance and the rule of law. As a matter of fact, uh, one clear way to judge about it is if you take a look at how many resources Putin spends on one hand on maintaining the democratic facade, 
he actually never scrambled democracy. He never came up and say, look, we're a dictatorship now. I'm going to be the one uh, lifetime ruler, and that is it. He still tries to maintain the facade as though th this is the will and the choice of the people, and very many resources are invested into it. On the other hand, uh, Putin spends enormous amount of resources on fighting uh, the liberal democratic idea, even today when you actually have repressive laws that allow pe to put people in jail for 15 years to uh, for just criticizing the government, when we have a record number of political prisoners since 1950s and so on. But still, Putin considers a democratic liberal idea his major existential opponent, and he spends a lot of resources on uh, fighting. Because we have seen many examples of genuine bottom-up demand uh, from uh, the Russian society and the ordinary Russian people for normalcy, for accountable government, for political competition, for free speech, for a rule of law, independent judiciary, and uh, so on. Uh, the evidence is plentiful that whenever Russians were allowed to relatively freely vote, they have chosen uh, not lieutenants of Putin's system, they have chosen somebody else. That the major protest uh, movements that have happened were defending uh, human rights and uh, basic democratic freedoms. Uh, and there was hardly any rally uh, that I can remember in support of, like, let's establish an imperialist uh, absolutist dictatorship. There was never anything like that happening. All the major grassroots movements in Russia were based on the ideas of supporting freedom, rule of law, and so on. So the demand is there. Yes, it is in a very raw shape. Yes, public opinion is uh, significantly distorted by the propaganda, but it is possible uh, to move forward capitalizing and building on this demand from the Russian people. The second thing is that we are in a much better position now than we were in 1991 with, when the Soviet Union collapsed because we have a lot of experience uh, with previous attempts uh, to build democratic institutions. A lot of it was negative experience, but it's also very useful because we do know uh, what mistakes to uh, correct and how to move forward to make sure that dismantling democracy will not be ever as easy again as it was for uh, Putin uh, about 20 years ago. Which is why, and I think Fyodor might jump in and comment uh, more on that, but our idea is to build a decentralized, as, as decentralized state as possible, involving multiple uh, self-balancing levels of power and institutions, strong parliament, government uh, formed uh, as a result of parliamentary majority, a totally independent judiciary branch, a very strong devolution of power to the regions and uh, municipalities. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we are proposing the idea to hold the local elections first in municipalities and then delegate powers onto a, a compact and limited uh, federal government, which will only be responsible for some specific uh, constitutional issues of governance, but it will never be acting again as a Tsar, as a dominant political force uh, over everything, uh, as it happened uh, during the Soviet era, during the, the uh, imperialist Tsarist era, and most recently replicated by Putin. So, as a matter of fact, we propose to dismantle the over-centralized system of governance once and for all, and delegate and devolve uh, as many powers to parliament, regions, municipalities, and all other sorts of institutions uh, as possible. We actually, Fyodor, I think, will comment on that. Fyodor spent uh, decades working in one of the major Russian regions, Ekaterinburg, and he knows a lot. And I also traveled across uh, the country, and I have seen this in greater detail, that since the dissolution of Soviet Union, uh, Russian regions and local communities have greatly evolved into, uh, into uh, something which is based on uh, self-recognition, self-awareness, attempt for 
developing uh, their own uh, regional competitive advantages, uh, identity, uh, cultural identity, and so on. So there is a very strong demand uh, for, from the regions and from local communities to take these powers, which are now being suppressed. The, the central government, since Putin came to power, effectively took them away and artificially created a system where uh, federal government is responsible for everything. We saw some, uh, you know, uh, ridiculous uh, stories like Putin having a direct line with Russians on television and discussing the, you know, uh, development of uh, water supply pipeline to a village in Tumen region, calls the governor and asks him to solve the issue. This is not going to be the case in a normal Russia. In a normal Russia, the powers of the federal government will be strictly limited uh, and regions and municipalities will have the resources and will have the authority to develop on their own uh, the way they want to. So as a matter of fact, uh, this decentralized state would also be, and I will uh, finish with that, would also be, in our view, a very strong guarantee against accumulating excessive resources for fighting wars and uh, projecting uh, new imperialist foreign policy. Because there is no demand for that across the country. There is a demand for improving living standards and uh, improving the infrastructure, which still continues to be in uh, many parts of the country in extremely poor uh, condition. Develop education and healthcare. Uh, like in the past three years during the pandemic, we saw these disastrous pictures of absolutely ruined uh, regional and local hospitals. Uh, who are not in a position to provide basic healthcare services to Russian citizens, people, regions, municipalities want to take care of that. There will be no uh, system in place anymore which accumulates a lot of excessive resources in the federal center, uh, able to further use them for aggression, for projecting imperialist foreign policy and so on. This new normal Russia will be busy in uh, bringing itself to order, improving things uh, which were really out of order during many successful totalitarian authoritarian governments. That is the idea actually that we dreamed of 30 years ago when Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, it was stolen by us. I would reiterate again, it was not Russia's people free will to switch back to autocracy democratic institutions were stolen from us in Putin's power grab, but we're going to bring it back. We just outlined briefly how, how it uh, possibly may work. And I will finish here and uh, would like to pass it on to Fyodor to maybe comment uh, on anything he wishes to, but particularly on this devolution of power, building a decentralized Russia with strong local communities, strong regions, and limited federal center. I'll stop here. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot, Vladimir. Now let's jump to to Fyodor. You know, Fyodor. Yes. Uh, again, yes. No need to to introduce you too much. You know, as it's written in our program, Fyodor Krasheninik of uh, Russian political analyst, journalist, and public figure. So please, mm -hmm. Fyodor. Thank you. Thank you for your invitation, and I will speak about uh, basic points of our uh, policy papers. Uh, normal Russia, it's not a miracles country from which all bad things, bad things will disappear. It's a real problem. It will be a country where millions of Putinists will live. They will have political rights. That is why it is important for us to think how to avoid revenge and build a sustainable democracy. And uh, the three most important points in our uh, policy papers, in our report are First, transfer of maximum possible powers, powers to local self-government. We propose to start with general elections of local authorities. The last battle for democracy was precisely in municipal election in the last pre-war years. Therefore, I believe it will work in future too. And second, a parliamentary form of government, government and all, at all levels federal, regional, and local. Strong governors and mayors to disappear. Instead, heads of executive power chosen by local parliaments, like in Germany, 
because uh, I remember that uh, strong governors in 90s, uh, they were like a, a pro, uh, like a small Putin's and they uh, built this system of vertical power in regions. And uh, because of that, uh, we are thinking that in future, uh, we should destroy this system and uh, rebuild to new federal Russia, like in Germany, maybe after war, because in uh, German, uh, it's, uh, it's interesting that all federal uh, territories, lands, uh, have only prime minister and parliament, parliamentary system in, in all levels, not only in federal levels. And third is new approaches to ethnocultural policy. Uh, it's a, a very new and interesting idea and uh, for discussion maybe, uh, because a local governments and special federal ethnocultural parliaments are representing not territories, but ethnic groups of Russia should have the main powers. It's very interesting because in modern Russia, uh, ethnocultural policy is policy inside regions, but Russia is big and uh, big country big, uh, with this big urbanization. And a lot of ethnic groups uh, don't live in territories and they live in all Russia. But this problem for languages, for culture, and old system of ethno, uh, Ethno regions is uh, old system of Lenin of Stalin, and our preposition is uh, to rebuild all this system. And first level is local self government, and people in towns and uh, in villages should uh, make decision about languages and about cultural policy. And all ethno cultural groups of Russia. Uh, should have representation in federal level, maybe like a special ethnocultural uh, parliaments. It's new, a new branch of uh, federal system, but I think, I hope, and we hope that it could be like a decision for Russia because modern system is not very uh, comfortable. It's a basic points of our uh, uh, our vision of future of Russia, of Russia, and um, it's uh, it's my idea too, and ideas of uh, Vladimir. And thank you for my short presentation because Vladimir uh, said uh, different things about our uh, documents. Well, uh, thanks a lot, Vladimir and, and Fyodor. You are very precise in timing, even even making shorter presentation than it was <laughs> supposed. So now we have really plenty of time to discuss. And again, I would remind audience, which is uh, uh, always uh, quite a big one, uh, to use an opportunity to write your comments or, or questions into the chat, and then we shall have possibility uh, to discuss them. And now we're turning to what we call in our program comments, uh, part of our discussion. And first of all, it's a pleasure and honor to give the floor to our uh, good friend uh, and, and quite often participant of our discussions, uh, Professor Marie Mandras from Science Paul University, and also of, uh, good books, including, uh, well, I will not pronounce them in French language, La Gore Permanent, and, uh, and, and uh, well, we know Marie very well, so please, Marie, take the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Andreas. I hope everybody can hear me well. Yes, excellent. Yeah. Um, I would like first to thank Vladimir and Fyodor very much uh, for this excellent report, where I uh, believe that a number of their points and suggestions really open uh, a way to many more discussions. And I see it uh, more as a framework where we can all sort of dig in and, and, and go further. Uh, and, and I guess this is what this discussion uh, is about. Before getting into um, the specific questions, I would like to remind everyone 
that we are at war and that in Europe, our number one mission today is to make sure that the 45 million Ukrainians are ally, are in a position to defeat the aggressor. Uh, and uh, I think our governments do very well understand that without the surrender of the Russian army, and fortunately, there is little uh, in your report and, 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 and other propositions for a future, a future Russia that can be implemented. So just, I think, remind this, because there is a timeline. And at the, so it is very important to talk about what opportunities will be open, but we have to say that this is not for tomorrow. It is after the military surrender. If it's anything in between, I am skeptical. Um, my first point is to underline very much what you say in your report. And I think uh, most of us have always tried to emphasize is that yes, the Russians are not a special species uh, uh, who prefer a dictator uh, and, and uh, a very corrupt and kleptocratic regime uh, to um, good rulers. Uh, that's absolutely, uh, absolutely uh, uh, obvious. Um, now, um, democracy is not a state or a status, it is a process. Exactly like authoritarianism and dictatorship are processes. And, and I think this is the way uh, we should look at it. Uh, democracy in Russia and in a number of other countries like Belarus that I think we should forget, an important point in, 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 in future developments. Uh, it will be a process. We will all, you and we in Europe and other countries and other experts, we will support a productive, promising process. Um, now, even though you know the Russians uh, uh, do, do, do not feel safe and happy and do not live well uh, under the Putin regime, uh, the thing is that they live with a sort of intimate fear of sort of helplessness. And this, I think, most of those who continue to, to work and talk to Russians, whether they are inside Russia or outside. Uh, and this is what I felt very much this, very, this last week, weekend in Berlin, working with Fyodor, uh, uh, with, uh, mostly with, with Russian colleagues and, and friends. Uh, there, there is this sort of fear of helplessness and the legacy is heavy, and I do not think, uh, Vladimir, but we've had this discussion before, that the Yeltsin legacy is an, a, a, a very positive legacy in what you mean to propose to the Russian public. Uh, and, and do remember, because you insist on a new constitution, of course, the a, a complete revision of the notion and practicality of federalism. I would like to remind everyone that uh, in uh, the fall of 93, uh, the Yeltsin government and uh, advisors, you know, they, they didn't go for the best constitution in December and that 20 regions, mostly republics, a few regions, ref, you know, voted against and two refused to organize uh, uh, the uh, referendum on the constitution, Chechnya and Tatarstan, if I'm not uh, mistaken. So this is really a question to you that I'd like to ask you is how will you, and I think I saw in the chat that there's also a colleague from uh, uh, the Davis Center that has a question of how how you, 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 you deal with this. Um, second point is I very much agree with you. Uh, and that's sometimes missing in other reports and uh, recommendations. 
is that you see you 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 want the immediate uh disbandment uh, disbanding of the FSB and the Ministry of the Interior and I guess <laughs> a few other uh, 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 structures or organs of power. I think this is key because I do not think the problem today is just deputinization. It is de -checkization. I mean, this, you know, the, the Putin regime is in many ways a Czechist uh, uh, regime. And this is what did not take place in 91 and in the 1990s. It's the de Czechization of, uh, of the regime. And I guess uh, uh, Daniel will uh, uh, talk more about other aspects that I think you don't go very much into, which are economic aspects, corruption, property, uh, uh, property rights, how, how, how th this is tricky. Um, a third point, if I still may go into this one, um, you talk about the nation, um, you know, that bears responsibility, that the individual should not bear the responsibility. There, I'm a little confused. And I would propose the, the following uh, notion or terminology, maybe. I think it's better to work with the notion of the state, государство, and say that, in a way, the Putin criminal state. Now, we know it's criminal. I mean, the man is under arrest warrant, and, and, and all his guys are under sanction, and they will be prosecuted. Um, so you can talk of a criminal uh, group that has uh, made the state what it is, and um, it, they have guilt, they bear the guilt. But I think unless every average Russian person who lives in the Russian Federation uh, is starts learning about what's happened, gets over its ignorance and disinformation and fear, then there must be work on responsibility of each one, you know, and, and we have the, 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 the German experience for this. We know that without this, without work on memory, there can be, uh, cannot really be a fight against, um, uh, against uh, fake, uh, fake history. To conclude, I would, uh, say that as a, a European, I feel in your report, one actor that is more than an actor, Europe is missing. And that I hope we can work. I, I know there were another report before, but I, I think it is important because what will happen in Russia after what might be a few years of transition period under international oversight, um, uh, 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 you will not alone decide. This is what happens after the end of a dictatorship. And um, for the Ukrainians, it is important that the Europeans are involved in the process, uh, in the process ahead. So I would like um, to ask you uh, how you know how you you think we could make progress in this direction thank you very much fyodor and uh, vladimir thanks a lot maria and i think it's very great you know styles that you are putting immediately yourself question so you know uh, to vladimir and fyodor and uh, i hope that that will make our discussion really very very interesting so now we're turning to dan Tresman, professor of political science at the university of california founding director of the Russia Political Insight Project. So Dan, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. And, and thank, thank you for inviting me to be part of this conversation. And it's great to be able to uh, talk to Vladimir and uh, Fyodor uh, about these, these ideas. Of, of course, the ideas are very congenial. Uh, German-style constitution, federalism with strong municipal governments, parliamentary supremacy, uh, independent judiciary, demilitarization, lustration in the economy, demonopolization, deregulation, 
uh, in the outside world, an end of the war with Ukraine, withdrawal from the occupied territories, including Crimea, uh, reparations, and a peaceful non-imperial foreign policy of cooperation with NATO and uh, the EU. Uh, so as an ideal to aim for, all this is, is pretty good. And it's useful to have a blueprint, uh, a set of uh, ideas and uh, uh, to orient around for the future. I could debate a few of the details. Uh, the third chamber representing the ethnicities uh, sounds interesting, uh, but what powers would it have? What would it do? On the proposal to let municipalities decide which region they want to be part of, uh, I wonder if it might make sense to hold off on that uh, for a few years. Changing regional borders could get pretty complicated fast. But uh, the big question I have is, how are you going to get to implement this program? This picks up a bit on things that uh, Marie was saying. As you say in the report, it's impossible to know how the Putin system will end, and it's important to be prepared. And I totally agree. But what kind of changes it makes sense to focus on, what strategies to try, are going to depend crucially on how the system ends. And you're unlikely to face a tabula rasa and to get the chance to change everything at once. If the liberal opposition has any power at all in the immediate aftermath, it's likely to be pretty limited. Uh, so let's just think for a moment about possible scenarios. So scenario one, Putin dies or resigns. What happens next? Well, the constitution says that then the prime minister takes over for three months and calls a presidential election. In the best case, that's what actually happens. And, and the prime minister and the central electoral commission decide to enforce current electoral law more or less fairly. Then there's a chance some liberal candidate will manage to get a party nomination and 100,000 signatures or to get the three, 300,000 signatures you need to run as an independent. Given what we know about the division of opinion currently, it seems unlikely a liberal opposition candidate would win. Of course, opinion might have changed by then, but it seems more likely that some kind of middle of the road candidate wins or Kremlin insiders manipulate to get one of themselves elected. But let's suppose that a liberal opposition candidate does nevertheless win and is allowed to take office he would still face a Duma that won't have elections until 2026. Does the president unconstitutionally dissolve the Duma? Could he do that? If not, what could he do? Well, he could end the war with Ukraine and he could pardon political prisoners, both extremely important. But on most other matters, he'd still have to get support from the current Duma and that would I think limit the changes possible. For instance, the Duma might not want to remove all the repressive laws that it's passed over the last 10 years. It might not want to abolish the FSB. Could a liberal president change the constitution lawfully? Well, he would need super majorities in both houses plus majorities in two thirds of the regional legislatures. Again, it's not clear what elements of the program could get past those hurdles. So in the very best case, we get a liberal candidate elected, an end to the war, and some positive changes that can be enacted by presidential pardon and presidential decree. Major constitutional change is harder. Now, now if, if Putin resigns after being publicly discredited, maybe public opinion would pressure the Duma to make more changes, but constitutional changes would still be very hard. So that's scenario one. Scenario two, Putin is overthrown by a popular uprising. Of course, this seems very unlikely at the moment, but just suppose it happened. Well, the leader of such an uprising would still need to hold a presidential election and probably would need to wait years for a new Duma. If such a movement unilaterally replaced the constitution, I think that would arouse a lot of resistance. Uh, 
it wouldn't be seen as legitimate if done by extra constitutional means. Scenario three, Putin's overthrown by a coup. Well, it's not likely that the military would hand over to a liberal. In the best case, it would agree to end the war, maybe make certain other changes. But it, it seems unlikely that military leaders would go for the full program. So where does this leave us? I agree it's really valuable to figure out a maximal program to aim for in an ideal world. But the next step uh, should be to figure out what electoral program could get a liberal candidate elected in a not too unfair presidential election. And for that, uh, you may need to trade off some of the ideal elements for things that could get majority support. I do think some elements of the program are likely to be broadly popular. Decentralization down to municipalities and regions seems likely to me to, to appeal uh, to a, a very large share of Russians. Ending the war probably would be popular. It sounds plausible that uh, the Siom poll that, that uh, the authors mentioned is right, that only 10 to 15% of Russians are aggressive imperialists. What else? Well, anti-corruption, maybe, uh, but people may not believe promises about anti-corruption. I think even with a great program, it's gonna to be tough for a liberal to win. Even if Putin resigned, that wouldn't mean that political prisoners like Navalny and Yashin would automatically be released, or that the regulations barring them from running would be repealed. One thing that might help at that point is Western pressure. Uh, if those in control care about removing sanctions and ending isolation, they might be willing to make some political concessions for those. That might provide the space for social movements to, to develop for a broader reform. So I think uh, one useful next step would be to think about uh, what would be the most effective electoral program. But beyond that, I think a priority should be figuring out how to improve the economy quickly. Again, uh, the West might help with that. But what worries me about the comprehensive, ambitious program of political reforms is that if it leads to chaos and economic crisis, power may go back to bad actors. And of course, supporters of the old regime will be sabotaging and resisting. There may be no honeymoon. Effectiveness is very important. Uh, after an over-centralized personalistic dictatorship, of course, a highly decentralized political order looks good. But remember the 1990s, uh, a fragmented, highly decentralized order, if perceived by the public as chaotic, is precisely what fuels the demand for a strong leader. Uh, the report is critical of the reformers of the 1990s for trusting markets to organize themselves. But another lesson of the 1990s might be that decentralization, if not balanced by integrating forces and sophisticated national bureaucracies, can lead to a politics of confrontation and disorder that drives voters into the arms of authoritarians. So the challenge is how to get uh, decentralization as in Switzerland, rather than decentralization as in Russia in the 1990s. So uh, just to conclude, maybe we need to divide the necessary reforms into several groups. Uh, so one dimension, uh, one set of questions is how fast can individual elements be implemented? Do they require a presidential decree, uh, a law passed by parliament, constitutional amendment? A second dimension is how much chaos and economic disruption are they likely to cause in the short run? And a third dimension is how broadly popular are they likely to be? Based on that, we could figure out the best, pos uh, best political approach uh, for each political scenario, what things could be done quickly, what things would take more time, and how to build the kind of political coalitions that would, necess that would be necessary uh, to get these various things uh, enacted. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, uh, Dan. Now we're moving to Duncan Allen.
uh, Associate Fellow, Russian Eurasia Program, Chatham House. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. Um, thank you very much indeed for inviting me to take part in today's event. It's a great honour. And a particular thanks to Fyodor and Vladimir for their excellent and, and thought provoking paper, which to my mind is, is a really valuable contribution to this this discussion, this thinking about the future of Russia, which is something I think we all need to reflect on um, going forward. Now, when I read the paper, there were, there were so many thoughts that immediately came to mind. I'll confine myself to three, um, simply to uh, try and contrib contribute to further thinking and discussion. Some of what I'm about to say has actually already been touched on by Marie and Dan. So, um, I'll try and um, add to what they've already said rather than simply replicate what they've said. Um, but my first point actually is this. Um, in my view, we should not underestimate the Putin regime's staying power. Now, for what it's worth, my own judgment is that the regime is probably less secure and less stable than it appears. Um, as Fyodor and Vladimir point out, I think very pertinently in their paper, it's it's often nigh impossible to predict the demise of authoritarian regimes in advance. Having said that, I would suggest that it's it, it's also necessary to acknowledge that the incumbent regime does have strengths. It has de demonstrated resilience and determination to hold on to power, and it does and it does learn and adapt. Um, this is a regime that rightly or wrongly, may be with us for several year, more, more years to come. Now, I'm not offering that as a prediction, but nor am I ruling it out. So in that connection, when we start thinking about possible futures for Russia, um, a couple of questions immediately occur to me. One is, what indicators of potential regime stability should we be looking for in order to alert us to the potential for change? And what also would be plausible triggers that might lead to leadership or regime change? So that again, we're, we're um, as, uh, as ahead of the curve as we can possibly be in, in a dynamic and fluid situation. My second point um, picks up on, a, on an observation that Fyodor and Vladimir make on page three of their report, which argue, argues that we should not be intimidated by the prospect of chaos after regime change. Now, that's an important judgment, and it's one that I agree with. Um, my view is that a change of leader or change of regime in Russia would almost certainly lead to heightened uncertainty. That's almost baked into the nature of the system in Russia, given the absence of an institutionalized mechanism for selecting a successor, and also given the existence of the so-called network state, this, this hollowing out of state bodies by informal patron-client networks. Um, but, but uncertainty is not the same as instability, let alone chaos. Nor, I, I suggest, is it inevitable that heightened uncertainty in the, in the event of leadership or regime change would inevitably lead to instability or chaos. Now, when we think rigorously about possible future scenarios for Russia, we can envisage plausible scenarios in which regime change in conjunction with other variables does lead or could lead to instability. But equally, there are other scenarios in which Russia avoids instability and chaos. They're also entirely plausible. My point here is that what is going to happen in Russia will be highly contingent. And I think Dan's point about the, the, the events that specific events that led to regime change or leadership change in Russia would be very, very important indeed in terms of setting the scene for what came next. Finally, a few thoughts about the, the policy prospectus that um, the paper sets out. Um, this envisages a transformation of Russia's political and economic systems and its approach to the outside world. I mean, it's avowedly ambitious, exceptionally so. Um, two general questions I have in that, in, in that context. Um, first of all, prioritization and sequencing. Um, 
a new leader, a new leader, a new regime would not be able to do everything at once. So which reforms would be the most important ones that needed to be enacted first? Would it be reform of the security services, as Marie has, 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 has compellingly suggested? Are there other reforms that need to be done side by side with that, if, if that is indeed a priority? But prioritisation and sequencing, it seems to me, would be an essential consideration from day one. And then there's the practical politics of reform. Um, almost inevitably, I suggest, a new leadership would require a reform coalition um, on which to take forward any credible reform programme that enjoyed, um, that was built on consensus and stability of opinion. And this would almost certainly have to include groups or individuals who are not supportive of everything else um, that you've, already, you've set out in your, in your very detailed perspective. So, for example, how would, would, how would one win the support of elements of the security services for reform of those very agencies? How would one push ahead with privatisation, given that privatisation would almost certainly involve taking assets from some very influential powerful people who would not who would not be supportive of that these these are serious practical questions of politics which do need to be thought about well in advance it seems to me and i have one final specific question about um the economics section of the paper um on a number of points at a number of points in the paper the, the paper suggests that russia should move away from its traditional reliance on the export of raw materials. So to be provocative, why? Why is that the case? Um, is raw material export, in, in fact, not Russia's comparative advantage? Now, I can think of other countries in the world that export raw materials or whose economies are built around the export of raw materials that are wealthy, that are democratic, that are well-governed and that are stable. So the likes of Norway, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, there will be others. I suggest the real problem is not Russia's reliance on raw material export. The real problem has been with what Russia does with the rents generated by raw material export, which have been used in particularly in recent years to subsidize an authoritarian state and to subsidize inefficient domestic manufacturing industry. Those are a few comments and I'll, I'll finish on, 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 on that note. But thanks again to Fyodor and Vladimir for an, an invaluable paper. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Duncan. And, and now we are looking to the final uh, commentator, Professor uh, Anton Aryakovsky, Research Director at the College des Bernardines from France. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. Dear colleagues, first of all, I congratulate the two authors of the report, Fyodor Krashenikov and uh, Vladimir Milov. For me, this work corresponds to the requests that we formulated in our last uh, seminar in France at the Normandy Forum for Peace with some people uh, of the Russian Democratic Opposition, uh, a request that Bernard Guetta, your colleague, Andreas, formulated insistently. The Russian opposition must work to make concrete proposals to prepare the Russia of tomorrow, already now. This which requires taking time, confronting ideas, clarifying them so that it can have serious credibility in Russian and international public opinion. I find it remarkable that your proposals are convergent with those of the Russian Action Committee, but also of Alexei Navalny's. You recognize Ukraine within its 91 borders. You condemn the war of aggression. You judge Putin as illegitimate. You recognize the principle of paying reparation to Ukraine. And you call for a new democratization of Russia based on the rule of law. So for my part, I particularly appreciate the rejection of historical fatalism by the two authors, and Vladimir Milov said a word about that in his introduction, because unfortunately, it is probably the main weak point of Russian democratic consciousness, which has been marked by decades of propaganda 
and by a strange religion of destiny, according to which everything is written. And the Russians would not be capable of, demonstra of demonstrating any virtue. So yes, democracy does not fall from the sky. I perfectly agree with you. And I appreciate your desire for a truly federal and decentralized parliamentary republic. You are right not to idealize it and to associate it with several measures to fight corruption, which is the endemic evil of post-communic regimes. Um, and I agree that the parliament must control the state security organs and must, first of all, eradicate the FSB and replace it with a simple anti-terrorist agency placed closely under its joint supervision with the executive. You must also, I think, demilitarize by reducing military budgets. You are not dealing in your paper with military denuclearization. In my opinion, this issue will need to be addressed, especially for Ukrainians, but not only, also for Eastern um, European people. Because it alone could reassure Russia's direct neighbors. But if this republic is really decentralized, then I see the advantage of having two chambers of deputies, of senators, and I share your idea of granting regional rights to the language and cultures of these regions. But I am not sure that a third chamber of the people of Russia intended for nationality would be useful because by creating it, you risk provoking frustration within ethnic minorities who would like to form nation states. On the other hand, I believe it is necessary to propose referendums to region which would like to separate from the Russian Federation, adding that this type of vote can only take place once. I also recognize the importance of the liberal orientation of the proposed reforms, but I will insist more on the horizon of justice of any democratic rule of law and on its Republican foundations. The rule of law is not only the separation of powers, it is also the defense of the individual freedom of each citizen and in general of all people. It therefore calls for a metaphysical horizon which requires to be presented in detail, namely the principles of justice, equality, fraternity, solidarity, freedom of conscience, as long as it is respectful of public order. In reality, these are principles which, are, which must be maintained in tension. For instance, freedom and competition on the one hand, cooperation and solidarity on the other hand. As Khodorkovsky writes in his latest book, the rule of law is not only respect for the law, it is above all the alignment of a legal order with a common horizon of justice. This is important because your liberal reforms, if they are probably justified economically, could lead to new social ruptures and in return provoke a reaction comparable to what happened in Russia in 1995 when the population decided to give a majority for the Communist Party in the Duma. Likewise, you plan to give more power to municipalities and region, which is very good, but it is an old dream of the Slavophiles, and this has never been possible because for this to work, we need a strong state capable of avoiding too great economic disparities between regions. But let me get to the point of my main criticism. If the authors agree rightly, in my opinion, in writing that the key to success lies in the ability to overcome the heritage of imperial thought, they do not have the time to make a real diagnosis of this imperialism. However, this imperialism is very old and deeply anchored in Russian mentalities, as well as in Russian institutions. Imperialism is a mythological turn of thought that associates a political project with a religious ideal. It associates the Tsar, understood as having legitimate 
sacred power with a civilization project. And Putin speaks about the state civilization. Uniting a single territory with a single dominant language, a single majority religion, a single obligatory historiography. Until this line of thinking has been deconstructed and explained to Russian citizens, nothing will be possible. We must therefore now begin all together to deconstruct the do dominant historiography in Russia since Karamzin, the dominant political theology in Russia since Konstantin Pobedanostsev, the dominant orthodox ecclesiology since the restoration of the Moscow Patriarchate by Stalin in 1943. These are difficult subjects, of course, but essential to address. However, you should know that important work has been already carried out by the first Russian immigration in France, made up of figures relatively unknown for me in Russia. Although, of course, they are, they are known, but not really. It is Berdyaev, Sergius Bulgakov, Georgi Fedotov. These are, the, Fedotov is the first historian who recognized Ukraine as an independent state. In Russia, you know mainly Solzhenitsyn, Ilyin, Pyotr Struv. These are the, the people who promote imperialism. So this is why I think we should work together on this. And my final remark is, what would you think about creating with the Russian Action Committee, which is a place which gathers lots of uh, oppositioners, a shadow cabinet that would start to work on these reforms? That's my question. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Anton. Well, uh, I don't know how I can manage discussion uh, because I see a lot of questions which came from uh, commentators. Vladimir and Fyodor, you should be uh, ready you know, to try to comment and to answer. And then, of course, we have quite a plenty of, uh, of questions on chat, uh, similar to what you know our speakers were asking. And first of all, maybe very simple questions. So how to implement what, you know, what Vladimir and, and Fyodor you, you wrote, you know, how you imagine that implementations, you do some kind of, you know, agreement among uh, federal uh, federal bodies, or what's, what's the way? You know? And second, as I saw also, here are quite a lot of questions on uh, European, support or what uh, Marie have said, you know, Europe is, is missing. Uh, so what's what's your thoughts about that? How much, you know, we in the, in the let's say, in the European Union, in the West, how much we can help uh, such kind of transformation? Well, you know, maybe you will start and then further. Maybe I should start because yeah, okay. my yes. remark will be short. Uh, we, we hope that, uh, and uh, it's our maybe great idea, that for a sustainable democracy needs people who will defend it every day because it is necessary and profitable for them. And we propose to create them through the renovation of local self-government because a, a re-election of federal president with this uh, Yeltsin constitution is not way for in future because it's way uh, in path. Uh, because it's, we have a strong president and strong constitution. It's not uh, for future. It's uh, is a is, is new ring for, for Putinism. And because of that, we propose these new ideas for um, renovation of all system not rebuild old constitutional system with president government. I don't believe that it's possible to uh, elect new pr good president because first time it will be maybe good president, but second president will be bad like Putin because for Russia, I, I, it's my uh, great idea is that it's impossible for Russia to have strong president. It's maybe good for the United States. It's maybe good for uh, France, but it's bad for us. 
uh, it's better in, in because of that we should change our constitution and change all our system of government of uh, the new federalization not old federalization and because of that we propose to start from uh, base base of democracy self government it's uh, my remark okay oh. vladimir can you can you add? Yeah, yeah may I? Uh, th there was a lot. Uh, there was a lot that was suggested by the colleagues, and really, this is very much appreciated because it gives us food for thought and uh, to process. Uh, we, we don't pretend this paper to be ideal uh, or sort of a reform bible. This is like more of invitation for discussion. But listen, I would compare it to uh, Elon Musk's effort to build Starship to deliver humans to Mars. Uh, like, if, if we would judge on the potential success of the experiment to building this uh, uh, heavy rocket to actually bring uh, humans to Mars one day, based on the political science approach, everybody would say now, no, after two failed attempts, this is not going to lift off, we should as well give up on it, right? But this is, this is not how these space engineers work, <laughs> So uh, we we actually uh, we are more uh, focusing and and uh, if you see the comments by SpaceX on the unsuccessful launches of Starship, they says no, listen, this is not a big deal. We're gonna build it again. We're gonna learn from the failures and we're gonna make one more attempt because we do think it is feasible. So again, I'm strongly against this fatalistic approach that because there are headwinds. That's because the society uh, is not experienced and not ready, that because there are bad actors and because it never worked before, then Russia is doomed. No, again, in my introductory remarks, I just outlined some of the lines why we think it's not doomed. Because, no, the dictatorship and authoritarian system was actually never accepted by the Russian people. It was always introduced by force and some of the most brutal oppression in the history of mankind. Russians genuinely, yes, they are sometimes brainwashed by propaganda and say stupid things, but they want freedom. They want rule of law. They don't want some big tsar always to tell them what to do, what to read, what to watch, what to eat, with whom to sleep and and uh, so on. This is becoming a very hot, touchy issues in uh, Russia these days. So uh, what are the, of course, we, we are fully aware of all the risks and thanks for outlining this, but there are also upsides. One of the biggest upsides is that generally we believe that the Russian population is with us. And when Dan was speaking about uh, what kind of result liberal Democrats can get, Classic liberal Democrats by the book, like Christian Lindner of Russia, may be not too much. But we are also not uh, Christian Lindner. We are uh, a major centrist political force, like uh, Navalny's uh, team and his candidates in the regions were able to get as much as 20, 30 percent support at the elections in this harsh authoritarian environment. So we aim for much more uh, significant results uh, at the elections. Like I can give you an example of East Germany, where Christian Democratic Union was just a minor partner of uh, East German Communist Party on the back seat somewhere. But when they held free elections in uh, March of 1990, Lothar de Maizière and Christian Democratic Union won 41%. Uh, and that is actually very much possible with the same ideas that we are promoting. What Marie has been speaking about the war, this is crucial and this is very important, that Russians understand that the war Putin is waging in Ukraine is not the war in any sort of Russia's national interests, but this is the war of aggression which violates the rights and interests of Russians themselves they will have to understand it. If they don't, I mean, let's be frank about it, then nothing will work. But we have a strong feeling based on our experience. And again, we're not some egghead liberal Democrats who spend their lives in uh, libraries somewhere in Moscow in St. Petersburg. No, <laughs> we are from the regions we used to work uh, tooth and nail actually in regional politics and campaigns all over decades 
we know Russia very well. So we actually firmly believe uh, that Russians, at the end of the day, will have the ability to understand uh, the connection between giving up imperialist policies, renouncing it forever, acknowledging what they did uh, to Ukraine, all the brutality, atrocities and damage, uh, agreeing to pay reparations and so on. Without it, there can be no normalcy. So we believe, based on our knowledge of the Russian people, that at some point, Russians will understand it. With Putin or post-Putin, but if you look at, we'll talk about it later, but uh, if we look at the public opinion trends, the understanding is mounting in the society, even despite the censorship and propaganda, the, the propaganda that something is deeply wrong. We need to kind of uh, revisit uh, whatever Putin has done. No, I strongly disagree. Imperialism is not and was never entrenched deeply in Russia. There was, I don't know, uh, Monte, if you can show it, I just send you a, a graph, uh, if you can show it on screen. There was a Pew Research poll uh, uh, three years ago, asking members of different countries, do they think that parts of the other countries belong to them? And there's nothing, I mean, Russia is behind some of the EU member states. You have the leader Hungary with 67% think yes, some of the territories of the neighbors of ours. Russia is well behind that, pretty moderate. About 50% people think that way, with one third strongly opposes. After 20 years of propaganda, this is understandable, but this can be cured. Detoxication can be made. We know how propaganda works. We remembered how Russians actually widely accepted peaceful dissolution of the Soviet Union, as opposed to what happened in Yugoslavia. We were a totally different example back then. So we believe that there's a way forward. Uh, many thanks for uh, all these comments and uh, points that you raised. Uh, I just want to address a couple of specific things uh, which, uh, which were uh, asked. Uh, first, how are you going to implement this? Then we actually, we don't intend this program. This is not intended uh, uh, to act like, you know, we are elected and come to power tomorrow and have to implement all this. We want to build major points of consensus within the society about some different issues. That we need to devolve powers, that we need to renounce imperialism, that we need to demonopolize economy. We believe it is possible because we also had great experience also in the regions working with communists. You know, Russian communists, they're all for supporting small business versus the oligarchy. They're all for demonopolization. They're all for environmental protection. They're all for responsible social policy. So we can find a lot of common ground even with their uh, supporters, you know. So we actually this blueprint is for consensus building, not some imposing some liberal blueprints uh, on uh, people. And uh, we believe that uh, it is possible on a nation state. I mean, whatever, like if ethnic minorities want to separate, let them vote orderly and separate. We're not against that. They don't have a big, uh, you know, uh, part in the Russia's population or territory. So most of the Russia will stay intact, even if they all separate, uh, like 81% uh, of the population and about 80% of the territory are Russian dominated. Uh, so ethnic minorities are very important, but if they even they all separate, nothing happens. We're totally not against it. We will still have to deal with this uh, relatively big uh, Russia. So uh, in this regard, that is not an alternative for us. What we are trying to suggest with Fyodor is we're trying to create mechanisms uh, which will make it attractive for ethnic minorities to remain part of Russia, and many of them want to. We will try to create additional channels of representation, like uh, Dan said, what, what do these new ethnic uh, parliamentary bodies uh, would do? First, uh, they can be provided with an opportunity of a legislative initiative. Right now, only government and members of parliament can introduce new legislation. This, can, this right can be given to them. They can introduce new laws that the parliament will have to consider. They can be, for instance, given a right to distribute some of the spending, federal and regional spending on 
culture, sports, whatever issues related to ethnic identity and so on. So, so this, they can become real uh, parliaments, not just some uh, consultative bodies. So we need to make system as much flexible and decentralized as possible. And last thing with um, Ellen's question about raw materials, what is so bad? with uh, being dependent on raw materials. Yes, we do have Canada, we do have Australia, we do have Norway, many examples like that. What is wrong, if you really scratch beyond the surface, is that all of these major fossil fuel corporations are at the same time huge recipients of state subsidies. Like Novatex LNG projects would never fly if not major state investments, tax exemptions and so on. Gazprom's power of Siberia would never fly if no, not major state investments, tax subsidies, and so on. So we're going to say, sorry, folks, raw materials, okay, but our priority is to enter the green energy market, new technologies, 3D additive technologies, biotech, whatever, right? No more subsidies to you. We're terribly sorry, Gazprom, Novatec, whoever, but no more subsidies. Let's see how this river dries out then. Ellen, I would be happy to talk more about that. But raw material economy is an artificially supported thing, which actually puts us on the sidelines of the dynamics of global division of labor. We need to catch up. We need to jump into sectors which gives us far more economic advantage. Fossil fuels, if they remain competitive in some areas, so be it but I'm pretty skeptical. We'll be happy to continue this uh, conversation. And again, many thanks for your questions and comments. Well, uh, yeah, thanks a lot, Vladimir. <laughs> I see great challenge, you know, because time is running. We have something like uh, 12 minutes, you know, and I would like all the speakers really to look into the questions, whatever you will you will pick or, you know, you will try to continue, uh, you know, what uh, exchange of views simply with Vladimir and, and, and further what he, they have said. But we are coming to such a stage where really I will ask you, you know, to look into what I would call your final comments. But before that, uh, uh, I would make my own small comment and maybe, you know, Fyodor or Vladimir or somebody else would pick you know, and, and try to elaborate a little bit. I was impressed by, by Anton and, and perhaps Marie uh, when you said, you know, about uh, what is Europe and Anton when he spoke about uh, history, you know, and historical narrative of Russia. And uh, I always, you know, uh, uh, I always uh, agree with that, that in, especially in such big changes or transformations of the country, of the nation, some kind of, you know, narratives are playing a very important role. And of course, Putin is very good to build that narrative of, you know, Russia as empire and glory, and he wants to restore, he compares himself, you know, with, with Peter the Great. Uh, but, you know, my guess is, uh, I don't know if that's possible, or maybe, you know, or maybe I, I have very naive view. But, you know, when I'm reading one, I, I will read one text, perhaps you know it very well, you know. Uh, and I will try to translate it. It's in Russian language, uh, but sounds very, very interesting. I will try to translate, you know. Russia is the European Держава. Russia is an European state or even Держава, I don't know how to, how to call it. So this is Article 6 of some, <laughs> of some you know, document. And Article 7, the last sentence of Article 7. Peter the first introduced values and manners of European style, and it brought such benefits for the nation which he himself couldn't imagine. I think that those who who are familiar with Russian history know from where those quotations I took. I took them from Yekaterina the Great, uh, so-called Ukaz. Uh, I mean, her attempts to build, you know, some kind of constitution, which okay, it failed, but nevertheless, you know. This is historical developments in, in, in Russia. I mean, my point is, is very simple. When we are talking about uh, what you call normal Russia of the future, you know, it's very, I think that it's very important that you are using this terminology. What does it mean, normal Russia of the future? From my point of view, first of all, it's European type country, you know, with you know, evolving of democracy you know, and things like that. But that is what 
you know, some kind of this historical narrative. I don't know if we as Lithuanians can use, you know, Yekaterina the Great as, as good example, <laughs> since we, our, our, you know, uh, common uh, union with Poland was destroyed. But nevertheless, you know, this is a historical narrative of Russia that, you know, great leaders of Russia, Peter the Great and, and Yekaterina the Great, you know, they were speaking and they were building European Russia. So, you know, I would call that Putin betrayed that, you know, narrative in a very, in a very you know, brutal way. But this is my, my small comment. Now, I would look, uh, again, maybe I will ask, you know, first of all, Maria, and you now Jean, we shall conclude with Vladimir and Fyodor, you know, at the end. So, Maria, your comment. Yes, thank you very much. We also had um, very interesting comments and questions in, in, in the chat. Um, uh, I'll try to be as quick as possible. Um, a lady uh, misinterpreted or misheard what I said, my last point about that I, I think we have to go further with Vladimir uh, uh, Fyodor and, and, and our colleagues into looking at the broader context, and in the broader context, European countries, the EU, uh, uh, European societies that are supporting the war effort, that are financing the war effort, EU money, it's not only American money or, or IMF money, that we are part of the process of getting out of this hor horrific war. So I never said pull Russia into Europe or whatever. So I, I think we need all of us to be extremely rigorous about the words we use and then not misinterpret uh, what others are, are saying. Uh, I was asked about by Ivan, uh, what if Russia doesn't surrender? Then it's a disaster. Honestly, it is a disaster. You, you, you know what happens if there's no surrender and if there's some uh, a sham agreement that will not hold. Uh, which leads me to the very first po point of my presentation. The war is our priority. Uh, it, it's very important that we do think about after a transition period out of the dictatorship and out of the war. But we need to work about today, I mean, the immediate, very short term, and this is the war. Uh, the second stage, short, uh, medium term, it's the transition between the surrender, the end of the dictator or dictatorship. We don't know how it's going to happen, but there will be a transition period before we get to the third stage, which is what you are addressing in, in, in your report. So let's not forget, let's not forget that we have uh, hundreds of political prisoners uh, inside uh, uh, Putin's prisons. They may not survive. So we have to change our pace. We have to move faster. And, 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 and uh, I will end by saying, that we in Europe, we are in a way your voice. So we need very much from you more and more um, very clear positions so that we can convey to our governments because our governments are now in a period of uncertain understanding uncertainty about the future. So we need you uh, um, very much to, um, uh, uh, you know, to, to not uh, talk about what's going to happen in, in a number of years, but also about what you can do. And I would uh, ask again this question that I've been asking all of you now for more than a year. What form of a platform of, uh, I wouldn't talk of a shadow government or an assembly, because there is no question that if you go into some form of representation, uh, it, it's gonna be controversial. But we do need 
in Europe. We do need you as a collective democratic Russia to exist. Not with the leadership, we don't want men. We, we, we would prefer a few women, by the way. Uh, uh, we, we don't want a shadow government or a future ruling elite. But if you want our governments and our public opinions to be ready for the long haul, the long war, I mean, Fyodor in Berlin uh, uh, on Saturday told us he believes it's going to last 10 years. If he's right, I hope he's not. But if he's right, we do need a body uh, and we have to think about it. We need a body that can be supported by millions of internet viewers in Russia and in the Russian emigration so that our governments understand that it's not Putin or chaos or Putin and the vacuum, that you do exist. Uh, and don't worry about not being representative, not being legitimate. It's a time of war of destruction. So we are, we don't want to be over, uh, uh, over legalistic. We are talking of a criminal regime that for years is no longer legal nor legitimate. So uh, let's, let's accelerate the pace. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Maria. Thanks a lot. And now I'm turning to Dan. Dan, please, your comments. Uh, yes, uh, I'll try and be very brief because uh, we have to end pretty soon, as, as I understand. Uh, to Vladimir, I, I didn't mean to suggest that you can't get to Mars. I just think you need to think a lot about how to build the rocket uh, and how to get past the gravitational field. Um, I agree uh, very strongly that uh, Russian public opinion is actually more modern, uh, more supportive of democracy, uh, more uh, desirous of freedom than uh, many people argue. I'm certainly not uh, supportive of any kind of fatalism. Um, so I, I do think there is a real prospect of, of change in the kind of direction that you wanna go, but I think it's crucial to think about the concrete, practical, political steps that will get you there. And I, I take your point. This is a document to try and build consensus. And I think that's very important. Um, but it's also important to think about, you know, what if the regime were to end in a month? Uh, as a very practical matter, what would the strategy be? How do you deal with a kind of a, a situation which is constrained by a constitution and the remnants of the old regime? Um, what do you do first? Uh, so I'm not saying that's that's a substitute for what you're doing. I just think that perhaps it's the next step or it's something to do in parallel. But I, I really do appreciate this, this document uh, for setting out uh, a vision of how Russia could be better and uh, starting a conversation that hopefully will lead to more consensus. Okay, thanks a lot, Dan. And now, Duncan, please. Thank you. Um, well, again, just let me reiterate my congratulations to the authors of this report. And Vladimir, I'll definitely take you up on the invitation to have a longer conversation about raw materials and economic and political development in the future. Um, just very quickly on, on, on what Europe can do here. Uh, I'm speaking from London, despite Brexit, I, I consider my country still to be very much part of Europe, despite recent and ongoing problems. Um, well, two really important basic things that Europeans can do here. One is to lean in hard behind Ukraine with military assistance and economic assistance so that Ukraine is able to defeat the Russian army in Ukraine. That is, that is, that is strategic objective number one, in my opinion. The other thing that Europeans can do, all European countries can do, not least the United Kingdom, is um, put our own houses in, in better order. Um, in many ways, to practice what we preach better, to run our own affairs according to the legal and ethical precepts that we like to um, advocate. Uh, as everybody will know, a, lo a long-standing pro problem for the United Kingdom has been its lax attitude towards illicit financial flows moving through the city of London, 
and other UK jurisdictions. Despite this war, despite everything that's happened since 2014, this is still a live issue in the UK. And just to be clear, this, this is I'm not talking simply about illicit financial flows from Russia and other countries of the region. This is a much broader problem. But the practical result of all this is that it undermines the United Kingdom's reputation internationally. It means that the United Kingdom is unable to speak with the authority and credibility it could have if it ran its own internal affairs better. This is really important in this context, I think, because if and when positive political change arrives in Russia, it's going to be really important that Europeans can speak with authority and credibility to a, a new Russian leadership and be heard with authority and credibility. So investing in how we run ourselves now is going to be really important in terms of how Europeans interact with Russia going forward. Thanks a lot. And, and Don? Thank you. I will say shortly that, first of all, thank you for this very interesting discussion. Uh, I would like just to say one thing to Vladimir when he says there is no imperialism on the essential level in Russia. I agree with this. And I agree with your desire not to be fatalist. But what I say is that it's already centuries that Russian state propaganda is grounded on imperialist arguments. And so it is impossible to just say it's not true, uh, Russians are for democracy and that's it. You need to work with political scientists, with historians, and also with theologians in order to deconstruct these arguments from state propaganda in Russia. And, and it's possible. And it, I mean, lots of people are ready to help you and to, to work with you. So uh, I am quite optimist, but really I think this should be done right now when there is time for this. Thank you again for all. Thanks a lot, Anton. So, Fyodor, your remarks. Uh, just unmute yourself. Okay. It was interesting conversation, and uh, we will have we will prolong this conversation in Brussels and another uh, cities because. Uh, uh, my personal, I see big interest to our discussion inside a Russian community in exile, because for people it's interesting for what we can uh, fight, for what we can live in our exile. And I believe that uh, our document is maybe a document of Mr. Khodorkovsky. It should be only first step to big discussion about European future of Russian Federation about all our common future in a new life after Putin and after this um, this war. Thank you for your uh, for our conversation. Thanks a lot, Fyodor. Vladimir. Uh, thank you very much, and I wanted to thank all the colleagues for constructive comments. Uh, we, we we are thinking with Fyodor to later. I mean, there's a lot of feedback. Uh, the interest is huge, which is already positive. More importantly, there is a huge interest from the Russian audience inside Russia to this paper, which is an encouraging thing. We'll be coming up later with some sort of publication addressing most of the, the issues that have been brought up. Uh, one thing which I really don't like here uh, during all these conversations is that Russian people, Russian society is often taken as something that, you know, that exists in its present form and will never change. So we only have to find ways how to approach, how to appeal, maybe too liberal, they will reject and so on. No, this is not how progress and enlightenment works. Many of our populations have been archaic, uneducated centuries ago. But then came progress. We explained. Many people listened, understood, and shared certain ideas, which they were not uh, sharing tomorrow. This is what I see a comment from Stefan on Lothar, the Mazier, who later turned out to be a Stasi agent. This is not important whose agent he was. What is more important that people who were seemingly supportive of the Eastern German Communist Party one day voted otherwise 
and so happened in Russia, and so happened in Ukraine. So it is possible. Progress as a result of enlightenment is possible. This is actually what we're aiming at. So don't take Russian people as a constant. And it's also very important to speak about history as well. Andrews, you brought up you, Catherine the Great. This is a brilliant example, often used to explain how Russian imperialism is and was perpetual. But Yekaterin the Great was not Russian. She was 100% ethnic German. Russians revolted against her. Emilian Pugachev took half of the country with political demands of abolishing the serfdom and ending the war with Ottoman Empire, which is very important. This was crashed. This was crashed by the troops led by Johannes von Michelsonen, who was also not ethnic Russian, but a pure German. And uh, later, Russians revolted many times. Then we had a Decemberist revolt of 1825 against an absolutist and imperialist uh, Romanov dynasty, which was hardly, hardly had any Russian blood at the moment, you know. So this is, uh, our idea is that the system was essentially imposed on us. Russians, there are many historical examples which would prove that Russians wanted normalcy. In 1917, uh, Russians overwhelmingly voted against the Bolshevik in the elections of Constituent Assembly. So happened in 1989 and 1990 and, and so on and on and on. So again, it's not hopeless. It is possible to work with the Russian population and the Russian people will continue to do so. I cannot, uh, you know, avoid commenting on this issue of uh, some sort of a coordinating body uh, between the Russian opposition figures. Listen, I know that Westerners want that. Like Henry Kissinger, the late Henry Kissinger said, or was it a fake quote attributed to him, but a very fleshy one. Whom do I talk to in Europe, right? We want one presidium of democratic CK KPSS, one democratic Brezhnev, democratic Suslov, and so on. Just one counterpart, right? We have to be very careful because it's our utmost priority to convey the right message to the Russian people. In Russia, we have a serious crisis of popular legitimacy. People are really sick and tired of being run by self-appointed folks who were never elected by anybody. What we don't need is just another body uh, who is self-appointed, claiming to represent someone, but never went through elections. No, we want to go through a different system. Svetlana Tikhanovska is a leader of the free people of Belarus because she was popularly elected based on the results of the protocols that we know. We didn't have that. Sorry, we don't want to self-appoint. I know this is a touchy issue, but I want our Western colleagues to understand how sensitive is that because we don't want to claim legitimacy, which we don't have. And that's an utmost priority because our main audience are the Russian people who we want to convince that democracy is possible. And it's not just another power grab, but this time by liberal uh, Democrats. Thank you very much for this discussion. I think we need to do more. And again, we'll be digesting all this ideas and comments, and we're happy that these conversations are taking place. Well, thanks, Vladimir, and thanks to everybody. Really, it was very interesting discussion. Time ran away, you know, in a very speedy way. Uh, so uh, at least what I feel, you know, that we have really a community which is united by the same beliefs that Russia really can become a normal uh, democracy and will become a normal democracy. Uh, last week we had the uh, anti-war committee big conference here in Brussels, and I said that we are united by a very simple dream next year in Moscow. Uh, and uh, that's you know what uh, we really see as our as our way in. Uh, in uh, during you know, forthcoming times. We don't know how long it will take, but uh, I agree absolutely uh, with the title of uh, Fyodor and Vladimir paper, yes, we can. And that's what you know, keeps us strong. And you know, despite all the difficulties which sometimes we see, uh, we can repeat and repeat, yes, we can. We can make uh, Russia different. We can make Europe different. And that depends very much on us, on Ukrainian victory, and on how much we can really support uh, such a development. So thanks a lot again.
and you know i hope to see you during our next webinars thanks a lot thanks bye